Good afternoon, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Hi, my name is Nene Takahashi. I'm a third-year undergrad student here at UC Davis and a pre-nursing programming coordinator for the 12th annual Pre-Nursing and Pre-Health Professions National Conference. First, we would like to thank the AAMC for the sponsorship of this event and allowing us to broadcast this panel worldwide. Today, I would like to welcome you all to the Masters in Nursing Admissions panel, and we are very excited to have four distinguished panelists representing nursing schools from across the country. During the first part of our admissions panel, our panelists will be introducing themselves and their institution, followed by the second part of our panel, dedicated, dedicated to answering the mo most popular questions which have been submitted by pre-nursing students to our website and through social media. If you have any questions during the panel, we encourage you to submit questions via Twitter or Facebook using hashtag UCDPHSA14, and the most popular questions will be integrated live in our panel. To get started, if we could have our panelists introduce themselves and their institution, starting with Mr. Sergio Sainz and continuing down the line. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sergio Sainz, I'm Director of Outreach and Recruitment for UCSF School of Nursing. Before I begin, I, I wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize uh, someone who's been in contact probably with all of us for the last few months about the conference and done a great job. And it's uh, Nene Takahashi. Can we have a round of applause for her? She's done such a great job. Thank you. Yes, she's been amazing. Um, it's great to be here with my uh, UC brethren from UC Davis, as well as from my colleagues from the Far East here who are visiting us as well from the East Coast, so welcome. Um, UCSF is a bit different from uh, a lot of the other schools here today because uh, we're a graduate-only institution, so we only offer uh, advanced practice master's degrees. Um, we're, school size is about uh, a little larger than 500. We're a research-intensive campus with a school of medicine, uh, pharmacy, dentistry, and graduate research. So there's ample opportunities for uh, interprofessional uh, research opportunities. Um, we offer the master's entry program in nursing for individuals without a nursing background, but with a BA or BS. Um, we also offer the MSN in nursing for individuals with a BSN, or a, a ADN and a bachelor's degree. Both degrees, you need to have a minimum uh, 3.0. Um, we also offer the PhD for those interested in continuing and uh, perhaps going on to be faculty or in research in nursing and producing new knowledge in the field of nursing. Um, and I would say I'm going to leave it at that, given uh, my, co my colleagues are also going to be speaking a bit and uh, be ready to answer questions in a little bit. Thank you. My name is Terry Harveth, and I'm a clinical pro professor at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. And we're probably the new kid on the block. I was here in the previous session, and some of the um, speakers were talking about their schools that are 100 years old. Um, our school was started in 2009. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I'm relatively new um, on faculty. I joined the faculty in uh, March of this year. I'm also the director of clinical education and I'll be the director of our brand new master's entry uh, program in nursing. Um, we have actually three programs, uh, graduate programs uh, in our school. The first one is a master's in nursing science and healthcare leadership. It's a professional master's degree for uh, individuals who already have uh, a degree in nursing and who have a bachelor's um, in either in nursing or in another field. And what's probably important to know about that program is, and for all of our graduate programs is that we do not require the GRE in order um, if you're interested in that. Um, I know that can be a rate limiting uh, issue for some students. Um, we also have a, a nurse practitioner program, and again, that's a professional degree program. It's for individuals who are already uh, registered nurses and have a, a bachelor's either in nursing or in another field, and they want to become an advanced practice nurse. Our nurse practitioner program um, is actually um, a joint program with our physician assistant program. It's the only program in the country that offers uh, a joint NPPA program. And um, if you are a registered nurse and you want to come into that program, you have the option of becoming dual certified as both a nurse practitioner and a physician assistant. 
And then our brand new program that this is the first time I'm getting to talk to publicly um, about this is our master's entry program in nursing that we are um, planning to admit our first cohort in uh, June of 2016. We're currently going through the approval process both within the UC system and also within the California um, Board of Registered Nursing. But we're looking at entering that first co cohort um, in just a little over a year. So very exciting uh, for us about that. And we'll be happy to answer more questions about that. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Knowles, and I am representing New York University College of Nursing. And I am the Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions. I, uh, at NYU, we're very uh, proud to tell you that uh, we have baccalaureate entry programs, and I have nine master's programs, five of which are nurse practitioner, then we have a nurse midwifery program, and three non-clinical programs, nursing administration, nursing education, and nursing informatics. I also am representing today our PhD program. It's one of the oldest PhD programs in nursing in the United States. And we also have a doctor of nursing practice, the DNP. The College of Nursing at NYU, well, nursing's been at NYU since the 1930s, but we became a college in 2005. And I'm very fortunate to have been the Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions now. This is my 10th academic year. I am not a nurse, and I am sitting with uh, a nurse to my right, fabulous colleagues. I have two sisters who are nursing, who are nurses, and I have the greatest respect. So my degrees are in higher education administration, and I must say there is something about a nursing student, a prospective nursing student. Those of you sitting there before me today who are RNs, what a wonderful profession you've chosen. And so I hope I can answer more questions for you today about graduate nursing, but after the panel, I'm happy also to answer questions about our baccalaureate program at NYU. Hi, everyone. I see some faces I talk to today, that's for sure. So um, I'm Sharon Warner. I'm a senior admissions officer from Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. I'm also the, sorry, I'm usually too loud. Um, I'm also the administrator of the doctoral programs, uh, the DMP and the PhD. That's my specialty area. Um, Hopkins is well known in the healthcare arena. I think everybody's probably heard of us. It's a special place. We sit amongst, actually right next to, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, across the street from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, as well as across the street from Johns Hopkins Hospital. So we call ourselves the four corners of excellence. Little, <laughs> A little full of ourselves. Um, we are um, specialized in community and global health, also research. We're known for our research at Johns Hopkins. We have a myriad of programs. We're 75 plus years old, uh, just the School of Nursing itself. We have two entry level programs, a, an accelerated BSN, which we will be phasing out after next year. We have a new master's entry in nursing. We have many, many master's programs. I actually wrote them down because I always forget one or two. We have a lot of NP programs, family nurse practitioner, pediatric nurse practitioner, uh, adult gero nurse practitioner, primary care, adult gero acute care nurse practitioner, CNS. Uh, that's a very popular role on the East Coast. Uh, health systems and management, public health nursing, public health nursing with midwifery. Uh, MSN MPH, it's a joint program with the School of Public Health, Mental Health and Psych NP, that's a brand new program. And uh, we have a Postmasters DMP, and we also have a PhD program. We are currently in transition. All of our master's programs are transitioning to doctoral programs. So uh, by September of 2017, all advanced practice degrees at Hopkins will be doctoral programs. And, and I'm sure we'll get more into that. So thank you for having me. Thank you. So just to start off with the panel, with the first question. The question is, what is the difference between NP and MSN degree? And does an applicant have to obtain the MSN degree before getting an MP degree? The NP is a nurse practitioner role. And in a master's program, you would 
usually, if at least in an advanced practice, in our case at UCSF, you would select which role you are going to when you choose the master's program. Um, it's, it's, it's a role, it's not necessarily a degree. The degree is the master's or the uh, entry program or the PhD, but the NP is actually a role that you choose when you apply to the master's. And then what was the second half of the question? Uh, does an applicant have to obtain an MSN degree before getting an NP degree? The NP degree, the NP role is an advanced practice role that you obtain when you get a master's. So you, you, they're one in the same. You can't get a, 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 an NP before you get a master's because it's an advanced practice degree. So, yeah. you, so you can get a master's degree without becoming um, an advanced practice nurse, um, but you can't become an advanced practice nurse without getting either a master's or a doctorate. And the curriculum is very specific to the track of NP that you're interested in. Very specific. There are typically four core courses that overlap, and I think that's true in most programs. So you might consider being an NP, an acute care nurse practitioner, perhaps a primary care nurse practitioner, maybe a psychiatric nurse practitioner, pediatric. So there are the areas of specialty. But as Hopkins, we also at NYU have core courses. So if one enrolled at NYU in acute care and thought, I think I would rather than specialize in a, as a pediatric nurse practitioner. Those core courses would go along with you and you could change majors. Nursing recognizes four advanced practice roles. There's the nurse practitioner, the clinical nurse specialist, the um, certified nurse anesthetist, and the nurse midwife. And so those are the four advanced practice roles um, that uh, nursing recognizes. In some states, Midwives are nurse practitioners. In some states, that's a separate role. But. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second question is, what is the outlook on job stability and job availability for those entering nursing school in the next few years? Good question. <laughs> um, and, it, and, it, and it, I would, ex um, I believe there's regional differences as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the economy being difficult as it's been the last few years, I think you had a lot of uh, individuals in the nursing workforce who did not choose to retire. And um, so it's been a little tougher, especially in more urban dense areas. I think um, from what we have hear from faculty at UCSF and students is that in more rural areas, um, there's more opportunity. It all depends on how far, you know, where you're willing to live and where the jobs are. I do believe that as the economy gets better, there will be uh, probably a lot more opportunities for, for employment. So um, I think definitely things are getting better, but um, my colleagues see what they see. Uh, I can speak to New York. Uh, first of all, the baccalaureate nursing student at NYU, I'm pleased to tell you I have uh, about 800 baccalaureate level nursing students and graduate students in January, graduate students in May, and so I put about 170 to 200 students each semester out into the workforce. In the state of New York, similar to the West Coast, we were not seeing when the economy took a dip in 2008, nurses who were scheduled to logically retire were not because the economy was suffering. So those nurses stayed in the workforce. So at that particular time, it was more difficult for the baccalaureate level nurse, the RN, to find employment. We're seeing that improving now. The economy is improving. People are retiring. Same with the West. We were seeing that students were having more of, a, of an opportunity to find nursing jobs, that is, in rural areas. New York City, the top prestigious hospitals, everybody was flocking to them. And we were finding that individuals who had experience as RNs were being hired as opposed to the individuals directly uh, graduating. That's changing, that's changing. And I'm pleased to report to you that we have two career, fa career fairs each year my students are being hired. The NYU student is hired. And so these are individuals, once again, with the baccalaureate degree. We are now in 2014. We are seeing that the predictions are coming true. There is a shortage of nurses in the US, and people are being hired. I think on the flip side of that as well, these advanced practice roles, are the jobs are there. The jobs are plentiful, uh, much more than as a, a new nurse in the market. 
um, with the onset of the National Health Care Act, mm -hmm. there'll be so many more people coming into the healthcare system, and there will not be enough physicians or advanced practice nurses to care for them. So in, if you have goals of being an advanced care nurse, wow, the world is your oyster at this point. You really have good job prospects. In the past at Hopkins, uh, family nurse practitioner is always probably the most uh, applied to advanced practice program, and students apply to that program much of the time because they think it opens the door to every job out there in advanced practice. What I will tell you is there are just as many adult JRO jobs, if not more. Please do not feel like you have to take this broad path. If you don't want to work with children and you don't want to work in a rural setting, there's no reason to um, just pick that because you think that's going to offer you a job. The jobs are there in the more specialized arenas. Um, so that's great news. The other great news is the baby boomers are aging out mm -hmm. and they're all going to retire at the same time. So there's really going to be a lot of job opportunities upcoming, especially nurse faculty. So as you start to plan your career, keep that in the foresight. You know, that takes a lot of education, often a PhD. Um, but there is really going to be a shortage of nurse faculty over the next 15 years. So um, just giving you some things to think about. The, the long-term job prospects for um, registered nurses as well as um, advanced practice nurses and nurse, nursing faculty is very strong. You know, we saw a, an artificial uh, reduction in hiring in nursing. We are still in a nursing shortage. It's important to point that out, that we still have a shortage be, of yeah. nurses. We don't have enough nurses to meet the current needs, um, and we don't have enough nurses clearly to uh, meet the needs when the baby boomer nurses start retiring. The average age of nurses working at the bedside is something like uh, 49. And that's the average age. There are many who are much older than that, some of who, whom delayed retirement. So um, while it's true that some uh, new grads from programs are uh, finding it difficult to find the job that they want, um, they are all finding jobs, uh, usually within uh, six months. And for some, because they have a more uh, a, a narrower uh, job market area. Yeah, so they, they want to only get into a pediatric inpatient or they only want to work in a particular area. Those are the, the nurses who are finding a little bit more difficulty, but the jobs are out there and are available and the long-term prospects are very strong. And may I just add, um, I have to oftentimes say to my baccalaureate graduates, don't just consider the hospital setting. Think of becoming a community health nurse. In New York City, we have the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. There are jobs there. Think of becoming a school nurse. The jobs are plentiful. One of my colleagues just uh, composed a book, 202 Careers in Nursing. So expand your thoughts about exactly what you want to do. It need not only be in a hospital setting. There are so many opportunities. That's great advice. And home health care, there are huge openings. Mm -hmm. I know on the East Coast, there are huge openings in that. And I've talked to some of our students who ventured into doing that, and they love it. It's a really rewarding um, way to start your career. So, you know, think broad. So for the next question, I'm sure everyone here is eager to know the answer to this question, but what best makes an applicant stand out in comparison to others? Wow, um, great question. Uh, there is no magic bullet or perfect formula. Uh, each one of you is unique, and I'm sure you've heard that a lot, but the other thing I would say is it, 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 the right mix and what you're, uh, to make you a good applicant all depends on the program you're applying to. And, and I would say that um, an applicant who is uh, very aware of the role they're applying to or the, and, and, and uh, perhaps the specialty in our case at UCSF and whose experience is uh, in line with that role and is congruent uh, is gonna be an attractive applicant. Um, we do a holistic review. So I know many of you are worried about grades 
and GPAs and GREs and so forth. Um, wherever you're at, you're going to need to do well, wherever program you're in, um, in terms of undergrad or whatever program you're going, you're at before you apply to nursing school. So do well and just be very aware of what you're applying to, prepare yourself accordingly and be able to speak about how your experience translates to the field you're going into or the specialty area, I should say. Um, at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, we will only look at um, applications for students who meet our minimum qualifications, and those relate to grade point average um, and science grade point average and a complete application, all the letters of recommendation. But after that, what we're really looking at are the essay, um, the responses to the essay questions. And what we um, really want to do is to admit a very diverse uh, group of students into all of our programs. We want to admit students that we think have great potential to take on leadership roles. Um, we want to um, admit students who have um, whose career goals are consistent with the goals of the School of Nursing. So valuing health equity, cultural inclusiveness. Um, our programs have a focus on rural health, community-based health care, um, aging, uh, health disparities. And so what we're really looking at is for a match between the applica applicant and what we think the strengths of our programs are. Excellent. I really echo that which my colleagues are saying. NYU, College of Nursing, uh, Masters, DNP, PhD, we're looking holistically. Certainly, uh, the stronger your grades, the better. Nursing, of course, an art and a science, and certainly NYU, a research intensive university, uh, the science is imperative that we see those skills. We want our students to be able to successfully navigate our curriculum. I will say that there again is no magic formula and we have wonderful support system in place. We have an incredibly excellent advising team, not only at our baccalaureate level, but at our graduate level. So students who need a little bit of extra assistance upon uh, entry into the college, we we're open to that. So I say to you all, if it is your desire, do apply. Fear not, apply. NYU, masters, we don't require the GRE. We do, the G, uh, do require the GRE for our PhD program in the MAT for our DNP program. Uh, the one thing, I agree, very similar processes at Hopkins. The, the one thing that I have to reiterate is you somehow have to relate your passion for healthcare in your application. Passion, we all want, and I've said this today to a number of you, we all want passionate healthcare providers. We don't want the person who's just showing up to work. And by the time you get to some of these um, advanced practice degrees, you have had to develop a passion. Medicine is passion. You're not gonna stay in it long if you can't hold that and keep that. So with that, your essays are paramount. Personalize them. Don't be afraid to personalize them if, if you're comfortable with what you're sharing. And figure out a way to let that passion show through. Uh, most of the um, master's degrees you'll have to interview with faculty, and they're going to be asking you questions that are focused on that same exact thing. If you want to be at Hopkins, you need to bring the passion, and you'll have People say that to you over and over again. And if you don't have it, you're not sure you have it, you better examine what you're doing and if you're going to be happy doing it for the rest of your life. Okay, so this next question is for Mr. Sergio Sainz. How heavily are extracurricular activities, clinical experience or organizations weighed when being considered for admissions? And what kind of extracurricular activities would you suggest for the applicants? Good question. Um, again, extracurriculars, work experience, they're a, one part of the holistic review. I would say one of, at UCSF, what we're looking for is an individual whose experience, extracurricular activities, volunteering, uh, revolve around three areas. One, patient care. Two, working with underserved communities. And three, uh, around the specialty that they'll be applying to. Um, I would say a sustained commitment is what I think comes out strongest in an application. And uh, 
I would say those are the main factors. Definitely, as was mentioned earlier, passion, your, your experience, your volunteering, your commitment um, to whatever area you're involved in is going to come through, and that passion is going to come through. And it's important that, uh, that whatever extracurriculars you're involved in or employment, um, that it's somehow related to the area that you're trying to attain. So I would say, again, it's part of the holistic review, but that's how we view it at UCSF. Thank you. Oh, uh, I have a question for you too. Um, what are some common errors that applicants do during the admissions process? Some common errors. Um, well, uh, we have not had a admissions process yet for our mm -hmm. um, uh, master's entry program, but I think um, one of the common errors that I've seen that I think are probably universal um, in reviews of applications for nursing school are, were mentioned in the prior session. So um, when students say, you know, I wanted to get into med school, but I didn't, and so I'm going to apply to nursing school, that's an immediate turn off as a nurse reading <laughs> so um, yeah. that application. It, it doesn't sit well that we're, we were your second choice. Um, um, but, you know, what the essay is a really important part, and I think sometimes um, students write a single essay and then shop it around to a variety of schools and you can see that it's not really tailored to the individual school. And um, I think that's a common mistake. I think what you want to do is to tailor your essay so that me, a, a faculty in the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, can see that you are familiar enough with our program that you would be a good match. I think the other thing is that don't just list the qualifications that you have or the experiences that you have. I think sometimes students do that and expect that um, the reviewers will be impressed by that. I think what's a stronger thing is if you say what you got out of that and how you'll bring that and use that to um, build on it within the School of Nursing. So if you were um, you know, the president of a track club may not necessarily be related to nursing, but are there some leadership skills um, or a, a commitment to health and getting people engaged in healthy behaviors that you can then translate that experience and make it um, realistic and uh, applicable to the School of Nursing? So don't just tell us what you've done. Tell us what you've learned from that and how that will make you a better nurse. What uh, I oftentimes will see or not see is that connection. Again, echoing, uh, really doing research on the particular school. So you've got four schools represented, for instance, here today. We all have different missions, all different visions. Focus on the mission. Could you see yourself at an NYU College of Nursing, for instance? What is it that attracts you? And do you see it as a good fit for you? So in reading, Again, it could be this focus on a generic essay, and that could be fine for many other schools in New York State. Look at the school, so I want to uh, advise you to see if it is the right fit for you, because don't forget, you are consumers in a sense. You are seeing if we are the right fit for you, as well as we looking to see if you're the right fit for us. Great advice. Um, I'm going to give you some practical advice. Um, I think students sometimes rush to that next step, that advanced practice step. If you're not sure what direction you want to go to, it's one of the joys of nursing. You have so many different roads you can take and so many changes you can make throughout your career to keep you energized. But don't rush to one of those because, you know, it's I was telling somebody today, pediatrics, a lot of young women come on the younger side and they want to do pediatrics. They haven't even stepped into their first nursing class yet, but they want to do pediatrics. Pediatrics is not just about liking children. It's a whole different ball game. These are ill children. It's hard to be around chronically ill children. They cry a lot. You don't even think about that. You know, it's different being around children. So don't rush to that next step. Get a little bit of experience. Go out in the work world. Uh, these are very competitive programs throughout all of the schools. And the more experience you have, the more competitive you make yourself. 
So don't be afraid to take a year or two years and navigate the system. You know, work in a med surge unit, work in a labor and delivery unit. Feel what it's like to really practice as a nurse. It's going to make you a better applicant, and it's really going to give you better insight into what's right for you. You can always go backwards and backtrack, um, but why? You know, why not set yourself up for what you're going to be thrilled about um, the direction you're going in? So that would be, I, I see that mistake quite a bit. Another common mistake, typos. Mm. <laughs> Nursing is a profession where attention to detail is very important. Show us that you have attention to detail. Have somebody else read your application to make sure there are not grammatical errors, misspelling, typos, because they stand out. And sometimes that's the difference between when, when you're looking at a slate of highly qualified candidates, sometimes it's those small details that really can make a difference. Okay. So the next question is, sort of going off of what Ms. Sharon Warner said, would an applicant be better off to get a BSN, work for a while, and then get an MSN through the part-time study? That's an option, definitely. <laughs> I mean, I think the experience is, even, um, definitely getting a BSN and then working for a while is, is a great option. If you're gonna go through the entry level master's program, whereas you have a non-nursing background, you definitely, after you graduate from college, you want, you're gonna wa we're gonna wanna work a bit as well. I know for UCSF, when we look at uh, students applying for the entry-level master's program, we wanna see what life experiences are gonna bring with them. A new grad right out of college, um, as bright as they may be, they just haven't had much work experience, life experience, to really have a strong grasp on perhaps the path they want to take, especially in, if it's an advanced practice role. So definitely, I think it's very sound experience um, advice if you go through a BSN and then work a bit and then go into an advanced practice role. Um, but really think about it. The advanced practice role or pursuing a master's, it's a financial commitment. It's a time, great time commitment as well. Um, if you do happen to have a family, um, it's something that needs to definitely be considered and you really need to be sure about um, what you're taking on, especially in terms of the role that you want in the specialty and, and what, where you want to work. So definitely, it, it's very sound advice, but whatever path you take, just make sure you're certain about it and you've researched it. I actually have a, a little different opinion um, on that. Um, for ever in nursing, we have said that you should have two years of med surge experience before you come back and get an advanced practice degree. The reality of that has been that many nurses delay coming back to get their advanced degrees until they're in their late 30s, early 40s. The average age of nurses graduating with PhDs is in their late 40s. As we can't afford to have that. We have the faculty shortage that we have looming is huge and if we delay graduate education or advanced degrees um, we're going to miss opportunities and I think that there are um, some schools that are recognizing that and who are willing to take students uh, or right from um, an undergraduate degree right into a graduate program. I think that that you have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of that and, and understand that there are things that I think are gained by continuing sort of student poverty, if, you know, from your undergraduate degrees and going right into graduate school. Because um, what happens is a lot of us, we get out, we get a, we're working as nurses, we are making a nice wage. You don't want to take the cut and pay that requires, you know, that is required when you come back to school. So, so I don't think there's a one-size-fit-all answer for that. And I think it's really important to talk to colleagues, to talk to trusted mentors, to talk to faculty, um, uh, other nurses about that, to understand what the advantages and disadvantages uh, are to coming in right away versus delaying coming in. Uh, currently at NYU, we are mandating one year of clinical experience still, and actually some of our programs even two years. One of the advantages to that is you're working in a hospital setting, and I will say of my master's students, of which I have about 
600 to 700 students, they're working and they take advantage of tuition remission and tuition benefits. Their employers are helping pay for their master's education. And that is very important to the students. So they balance their lives, they're working full time. Primarily my students are going to school part time. So we've constructed our master's programs such that the courses are taught in the evening. People work during the day, they go to class one or two nights a week. So we really make our program applicable to the working adult. So there are some uh, thoughts to think about when you're looking at employers, do they have good tuition benefits for you? And will they help you pay for graduate school? We're in the, exactly the same boat at Hopkins. It's a very personal choice. It, it might depend on finances. Um, one of the trends we've seen in the past couple of years at Hopkins is for our students to get their BSN. They're pretty typically offered a job at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Who wants to say no to that? That's an awesome experience to have on your resume. And they have already applied to our master's degrees and they can defer, but just once. So they defer, get that year, get that great experience that may not come again, and uh, then they go into the master's program. They can't delay it. It's purposely just a one-year deferral because we don't want them to walk away if that's what they want. You know, we know life gets in the way. Um, so that's a real trend for us. Um, I just, I do think it's not one size fit all. I think it depends on your circumstances, your goals, uh, where you came from, where you're going. And um, it's, I, I see many more though going directly into master's programs. It's kind of interesting. Um, we do not require experience for any, everything except acute care um, MP. We do require one year of experience for that. But at the same time, you'll hear faculty say the students with even just one year of experience tend to do better in the program. Um, same with um, employee benefits. Hopkins, Hopkins the hospital gives great employee benefits and that really helps to pay. Um, our programs are flexible, so our students can continue to work full time and do the master's programs part time, and that's a great um, balance of the two. You know, they have some financial help coming in, and um, they're quite flexible. Thank you. The, the next question is, how flexible are instructors, uh, instructors excuse me, when it comes to family, full time jobs, and other responsibilities outside of school? It's a good question. As I had said earlier, um, taking on the advanced practice role or a master's degree is a big commitment. Um, I'm glad to hear that there's a variety of programs at other institutions. At UCSF, our, we don't have online programs and there's all students, I would say all but 2%. Um, go straight through in two to three years. There's, there have to be full-time students. Um, and. I would say faculty are very understanding and, and uh, the advisors are also work well with students, but definitely um, there is a timetable. I think there's a bit less flexibility at UCSF than there is at other institutions. The positive about it is that you're guaranteed all courses and you will get through in that time frame that the programs are designed to be in. But uh, it's, I think some, like any institution, some faculty are better than others. Um, but it is, it is a bit more of a um, rigid program than some other institutions. Yeah, you, at UC Davis, um, it's similar. Our um, master's and our PhD program all require full-time um, uh, coursework. Uh, some of you uh, who live locally may know that our School of Nursing was started with a $100 million gift from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And because of that, they wanted to see graduates right away. They wanted to, they, the school has been held to a very tight timeline to ensure that the money that they've invested um, in the school is having outcomes and that means first and foremost graduates. Um, the good thing is that we have the luxury right now of scholarship money for students and you can look online um, to see what that is but it, it's actually uh, very generous scholarship packages that are available for our students because we recognize that it's difficult to 
to work and go to school full time and we want to provide some financial support for students um, to be able to do that. Um, in terms of family friendly, um, you know, I think the philosophy of our faculty is that as nurses we need to be family friendly. So I'm teaching a course and um, last week one of our students brought her um, three month old baby to class and um, it was our newest uh, uh, admission, I guess, to the program. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm sure she's going to make a great nurse, the, uh, this three month old, eventually. <laughs> that's very, oh, that's so very true. Uh, NYU, we are, I say at every orientation, we enroll uh, nurses, graduate nurses, three times a year in September, January, and June. And I say at orientation, we understand you are busy individuals, you're balancing, you're doing a juggling act, you're working, you're going to school, you're taking care of spouses or family members or parents or children. We understand that, and there is this philosophy, there is this nature that we want you to work hard, but we understand. And so as the Dean for Student Affairs, not only the Dean for Admissions, it's one of my charges to make sure I'm looking to make sure that my students stay well and we listen to them. And there are times when one needs to take a leave of absence. Perhaps life gets in the way, somebody gets ill. Yes, I think there's, a, there's something about nursing faculty we're here to uh, ensure that the experience works with your time frame. I think that's pretty universal, at least it sounds that way. And the nice thing I've really learned about nurses, they're really organized. <laughs> and they organize these groups. You know, they have parent co-ops for, for students, and they share uh, you know, respon babysitting responsibilities with their colleagues they're really good at kind of creating these situations that help each other. And, and they do it without intervention. I mean, we, I really sit back and watch and they say, can we come to the resource fair? I'm like, oh yeah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for being a resource. Um, so I, I think as daunting as some of those life, life responsibilities are, um, there are many students at all levels of nursing who have families, you know, children, time-consuming responsibilities with that, and they make it work. And then they are on panels for the new students to tell them how they made it work and, the, and give them hints on how to um, stay well. You know, we have a lot of these life-enhancing kind of lunchtime, uh, what do they call them? Uh, Brown bag. Chat, chat and learns or something like that. And, you know, they have yoga instructors come in because, a healthy mind helps with a healthy body. So um, I, I definitely think that just the nature of nurse, nurses, nursing faculty, and the support group around the nurses are truly supportive of those kind of challenges. Thank you. So this will be our final question. Um, what are some financial aid awards does your school offer? There are several uh, financial aid scholarships that are available at our school. Um, I will say that uh, for the master's program, uh, there's a lot more funding involved. Um, for our pre-licensure year, for the MEPIN master's entry program in nursing, there is not as much, and that's the tuition's a bit higher that first uh, pre-licensure year. But once the students go into the master's level, there is a lot more uh, scholarships available uh, to students that, that uh, many of which they will qualify uh, for automatically. Others, um, they might be interviewed. Some they have to apply for. So there is a good amount of financial support. But what I will say is if you do decide to take on the advanced practice master's role, um, there's de generally less funding around than when you were an undergraduate. And it is a financial uh, cost that you're taking on, so just uh, be wise about it and really plan it out. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, we do have some scholarship dollars that are a part of our um, initial startup funds. We also are actively engaged in philanthropy to try and um, develop additional scholarships uh, for students. Um, financial aid and um, depending on the program that you come into, um, there may be um, faculty repayment um, uh, opportunities as well. There are a number of federal uh, programs that are looking to try and attract nurses into 
um, nursing education and um, primary care roles or in um, underserved areas. So depending on the kind of uh, program that you go into, there may be some additional opportunities and we certainly work with uh, our students and applicants to try and help them get as much financial support as they can. Uh, one of my charges as the Dean for Student Affairs and Admissions is that of scholarship. At NYU, we have a scholarship officer who reports to me, and I am pleased to tell you that if you were to go onto the NYU College of Nursing website and you were to look up scholarships, we have, fortunately, scholarships for our graduate nursing students also. Many of our alum, and again, I mentioned that we've been around since the 1930s, give back specifically scholarship dollars, and they'll specify this is to be for pediatric nursing at the master's level, or this is to be a grant for geriatric, or et cetera, et cetera. So I would say to you, take a look at our website. In addition, I say to all students who are contemplating NYU nursing, fill out the FAFSA form. You may say, well, I did that for my baccalaureate and I might not have gotten any money. At the graduate level, in order to receive any scholarship dollars, one needs to have a FAFSA on file. We need to see what your estimated family contribution is at the College of Nursing at NYU. We also have monies designated specifically for my master's students. And there is a committee that makes decisions on newly enrolling and continuing graduate nursing students. And that is called the College of Nursing Scholarship. My colleague also mentioned the federal monies that are available. NYU is one of the recipients of the Nurse Faculty Loan Program. And logically you might think, well, I should probably only be a nursing education major. Not necessary. At NYU, there are other majors, our primary care major, for instance. You can take advantage of the Nurse Faculty Loan Program, and what that does is it forgives part of the loan upon graduation if you agree to be nurse faculty. And you need not only be focusing upon nursing education as your major, so take a look at that opportunity. And in addition, I remind you, when you are seeking employment, make sure that you speak to the benefits component of the uh, nurse recruiter when you say to them, Will I get tuition remission or some tuition benefits? So you can build a package. The majority of my students, I must say, are coming to NYU with a combined package. Federal monies, federal loans, scholarship dollars, some private loans, but also tuition remission and tuition benefits from employers. Yeah, that's huge for our students as well. Hopkins, the hospital, they're separate entities, um, they give $15,000 a year of um, educational benefits. That's huge for our program. So as you find these employers, that's something you want to know if you know you're going on to advanced practice education. Um, the loan forgiveness is a big one. Um, that, when you get to that next level of nursing, there are a lot of opportunities for loan forgiveness. For example, um, there's a, a lot of programs for loan forgiveness to work in underserved uh, hospitals, hospitals that sit in underserved, uh, serve underserved populations. Johns Hopkins Hospital is one of those. So who wouldn't want to work there in their nursing career? And then if you give you know, X amount of service back to them, you have loan forgiveness. Um, there's also the Nurses Corps is a great resource. They give some great, um, great help. They tend to be late in the game. That's my one issue with them. You find out so late that you can't count on that for help. It's a, a nice surprise at the end. Um, and then there are HRSA grants throughout different schools. The, the um, financial aid pages of various schools are great resources. Um, you know, out here in the West, we don't have this much in the East, but if you agree to work on Indian reservations, there's a special grant for, and some people really have interest in that. So as you look into your, your graduate education, start making yourself a list of here's some ways I can make this affordable and I won't be paying back forever, because there really are some things out there, but you have to put a little research into it. And may I also add, I, uh, hearing my colleagues speak, 
I'm reminded if anyone is sitting here who has served in the military, NYU College of Nursing has just received military friendly status. I'm so proud to share that with you. What that means is we are part of a yellow ribbon program, so students are taking advantage of the GI Bill. So if anyone or a colleague or a friend of yours has military experience, have him or her do that exploration because you're going to find more and more schools are deemed military friendly. Thank you. And I apologize, there is about still 10 minutes for our panel, so I would like to start off with Mr. Sergio Sainz. Is there any final advice that you would like to give our attendees today? Wow. Uh, I would say definitely whatever path you're thinking of taking, research it well and take on the experience that, that will really prepare you for that role. Um, I would say that's the best I, advice I can give. I, earlier there was a question, what's one of the common mistakes that you always see? Uh, one of them is that an individual doesn't have a full understanding of the role or the specialty that they're going into, or even the setting that they might be working in. They, they just say they want to get into the profession or they just want to be an MP, but what that really entails, where you'll be working, who you'll be working with, what you want to really specialize in, that knowledge isn't there. And, and then it just really hurts them in the admission process. So I would just say really immerse yourself in the path that uh, you want to take on. Um, I would just uh, thank you for your attention um, this afternoon. The um, Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis is a tremendously exciting place to be. And um, if you see yourself as someone who is um, interested in health equity, who is interested in community-based um, nursing, aging, rural health, I would really encourage you to uh, think about applying to um, one or more of our programs. I, I, I think we have a tremendous faculty and it's an exciting place to be right now. I think a final comment, if I may say, again, I have the most incredible respect for nurses. I am not one. I have two sisters who are nurses. And I must say that nurses are probably some of the most hardworking people I've ever met, incredibly organized. And this is what you aspire to. And if I have sitting before me already practicing RNs, congratulations on the work that you do. It is an incredible profession, growing and so respected, so incredibly respected. When I say to individuals what I do and how I am a dean for students at a college of nursing, there is this feeling of uh, absolute and awe of what you take on each day. You know, I focused my uh, doctorate, my doctoral research on nursing ethics, and it was one of the most incredible experiences I had communicating to, and my focus was actually upon baccalaureate level nursing students and how they experience learning ethics in the classroom versus the clinical setting. Listening to a nursing student, there's something about when you cross the threshold of nursing school, you become a professional and you begin to really live that experience. You take it so very seriously. And the way that you've given attention to us this afternoon, you're all going to be amazing nurses. And so I commend you all. And so I would like to just say to you, you're making great choices. You're going into a wonderful, wonderful profession, which is so highly regarded. I also want to say, I've been to Davis a number of times for different information sessions and things like that. And I'm always so impressed by the turnout at activities like this, the pre-health activities, it really shows a commitment by the students that is not at every school. I can say that with real, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not just kind of trying to blow your head up because you, some people are just doing what they gotta do to get get through and that's just not the case here to take the time and learn that's helping you that's helping you forge your path so um, anything you can do you know read what you can read there's so many journals out there there every school probably puts out a magazine that's made public that helps with the trends in nursing I know you're busy but fit that kind of stuff in it really helps um, forge your path go to these these fairs and these activities, meet who you can meet, make those professional connections. Um, three years from now, one of you may come and say, remember, we met at Davis, 
I want to be in your PhD program. I want to change the world with what I'm doing. I want to study domestic, um, intimate partner domestic violence, and I want to stop it. I want to have something to do with that. And I, what a rewarding, I mean, I'll be selfish here. Wow, my job's so important because I find you and I help match you to where you belong, and I get the warm fuzzy when something <laughs> like that happens, and I am so proud to be doing this. I was a music major in college. You know, I like music too, but <laughs> I just, sometimes I walk around Hopkins. Some days it's like, oh, it's Hopkins, big deal, I work here. You know, I'm in the middle of the city, can't park anywhere. <laughs> Other days, something happens, and a lot of times it's somebody from that very, very underprivileged community who's barely holding on. And they'll see me with my badge and they'll say, thank you for everything you do for our community. And I just wanna cry. And that's the kind of profession you're going into. And you're the front line. I'm the second line. Wow. So congratulations on the choice. It really will make you have the warm fuzzy. Thank you. That will be all the questions that we have now. Please give a round of applause to our panelists and their informative answers. Thank you. <laughs>